Right. My name is Andreas. I'm uh, with Samsung, where I work on Rust in the kernel. I consider myself a plumber more than a language expert, um, and I, I leave the language compiler expertness to some other people. Just so you know my point of reference. Uh, so there is going to be a lot of code on these slides. So, and I don't know if the size is going to be cool, but there is. I'm told there's like a little download button in here, so you can go and, and get the slides if you want to. If you can't see it. Uh, nevertheless, even if we are full screen, please still uh, write notes in the share note uh, tab. The organizers wanted us to, to tell you that. Uh, please uh, encourage you to, to write notes in, the, in, in that tab. Even if it is full screen, uh, you don't see it right now. Thank you. Um, and this, this talk is going to. It's going to be sent around abstractions for the HR timer subsystem, but really what it's going to be about is a programming pattern uh, called the intrusive pattern that Alice uh, coined. I think she coined the name for the work queue. And uh, so if you, are, if you already know this pattern, then uh, I hopefully you can tell me if I'm applying it right or not, and we can have sort of a live review session. Uh, if you don't know this pattern, then you can learn about it and you will uh, have an easier time understanding the work queue bindings or the HR timer bindings or maybe some other bindings that are, are using the same uh, pattern to, to build the abstractions. Yeah, so that's it. Get, let's get started. Arrow key not working. Just going to click. Next. Yeah, so agenda is why uh, do this work uh, for the HR timers, what have been done before, and then I'm going to go into detail about the, uh, the patches that are now uh, on the list in version 2, and uh, then a little bit about how we're going to handle allocating stuff on the stack that uh, can't go away. The reason I'm doing this work is that the um, Rust... Um, block abstractions, uh, I'm pushing those upstream. And one of the deals with the, with the uh, block community was we, we put in some uh, null block, uh, a null block driver, and they would like to see a feature parity with the C null block driver so they can more easily compare uh, between like what, what does a driver look in C, what does it look like in Rust. And um, that sent me building abstractions for a lot of subsystems that the null block driver interfaces. One of them is the uh, HR timer subsystem for emulating IOs that have some kind of uh, completion latency. Uh, and that's why I'm trying to interface the uh, HR timer subsystem. There's, there's some other stuff uh, as well. Right now we have module parameters, and next up we're going to build configFS uh, abstractions. And as far as I'm aware, the HR timers are also a dependency for the virtual, uh, the Rust implementation of the virtual kernel mode setting, which is some GPU thingy, I think. So it's good we are more that can use this work. So uh, a little bit of history. Uh, I believe sometime last year, Bakun pushed some uh, uh, work in progress uh, uh, kind of uh, <laughs> you didn't send it to the list, but you did do some timer work for the database timers, right? Uh, I put some, uh, I sent the V1 patches uh, four or five months ago, and then um, just as the block guys ask, oh, could you like feature complete this? Uh, the, the response on the, uh, because I just implemented the part of the timers that I, I needed for my work, but then again, the response was, could you please add a more feature complete API for this timers? And so um, you see where this is going. Like eventually we'll cover all of the kernel, hopefully. Um, there were some issues with the, uh, with the first version of the patches. Um, and then of course the work queue uh, is the, the code for the uh, HR timers are share, have a, a lot of similarities to the, the code that allows us to interface the work queue from Rust. So, I want to credit that. Briefly, the um, CHR timer API, as I understand it, has these uh, components uh, listed in this slide. To use it, you allocate a struct HR timer that um, uh, you have to initialize it after you allocate it. 
and you have to write a function pointer into the struct, which will be the function that's called when your timer expires. You then have to arm the timer or schedule it with uh, one of the uh, HR timer start uh, functions. You can cancel the timer, and you can manipulate the expiration uh, date of the timer. And that, that's sort of the, uh, the interface we have for these timers. We're gonna, uh, to, to achieve this, we're going to have a few uh, traits. I'm going to go into each of these in, uh, in turn, and hopefully you'll get an idea of um, how we're trying to put uh, these concepts into Rust. Uh, at any time, feel free to, uh, to stop me and ask questions so we can have a discussion if something is not clear. Um, first of all, we're going to cover the, uh, we're going to wrap the timer, the H struct HR timer, in a Rust type just so we can, al we can allocate it um, safely in Rust and put it into our Rust structs. That's going to be the struct timer. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna go into each of the rest of these in uh, one by one. Hopefully this code is big enough, but otherwise please go download the uh, slides. We have a trait called has timer, which basically expresses that a struct has a timer embedded somewhere. We have two functions, one, f one function for going from a pointer to the, um, the outer struct to the inner struct, and one for, from going to, from the uh, inner struct to the outer struct. So basically, if someone gives you a timer, uh, sorry, a pointer to the embedded timer, you can go back and find whatever struct it's embedded in. It's just pointer manipulation, but in order to do this safely in Rust, we have to um, uh, express it in a certain way. But, but this trait ha just has these two methods, and then we have some safety requirements on those for how to use them properly. The idea is not that you implement <coughs> this uh, by hand. You will have a, uh, a macro for implementing this for you. And this, uh, in, if you have not seen Rust macros before, um, it's uh, similar to, in some respects, it's similar to C macros, you have a piece of uh, text that like, um, uh, unfolds to another piece of, of text, more or less. And in this case, we have, um, I'm not going to go into each and every bit here, but in, each, uh, in this case, we, will, um, we can put this impl has timer, and then it will expand to this code down here. And this code implements the trait that we just defined, uh, which has these... Um, these functions for going back and forth between the pointer to the, the uh, uh, host struct and the pointer to the embedded timer. And the important part is, uh, is this one, where we just have an offset off. And we use this offset to just you know, add and subtract, go back and forth. The, um, uh, an important trick in this particular macro is that we re-implement one of the methods, and that makes it certain that we can only uh, this code will only compile if the struct actually has a, a timer embedded of the right type. So if you, if you try to apply this macro on a struct that does not have a timer with this uh, particular name that you give in the macro, you will compile fail. And you will never sort of um, inadvertently try to ask for a timer in a struct that doesn't, has one, that doesn't have one. Uh, the reason for that is uh, this uh, function here that we override uh, has to return a, a timer type. And uh, when we're getting the, uh, the, the, this uh, expression here has to evaluate to that type. Right? So it's type checked through that. If, if this uh, expression yielded another type, you would get a type, uh, like a type mismatch, and it wouldn't compile. So this is an example of uh, how you would use this. Up top, we have I, I implement my uh, I want to have a I have a, some kind of struct and I want to put a timer in it. So I, I define my struct, I put a timer in it, and uh, I call the macro like this. Impl has timer for. Now it's actually difficult for me to see on my screen, but I hope hopefully you can see it. Uh, you invoke the macro like this. Impl has timer. Uh, of uh, self, which is going to be this uh, arc intrusive timer, and 
um, that you also specify here, and you specify the name of the field here. As you see, self.timer. If, like, I put uh, self.flag, it would not compile. It would say, this is not a timer. You can't, like, the offsets that I'm calculating is not into this uh, type that you want it to be into. And so we don't, uh, with the, yeah, so I put the expanded code down here, just for reference, what it expands into. And this means we don't have to write any unsafe code in order to do this conversion between the pointer to the timer and the pointer to the containing struct. We can just put this macro and um, we verify that this unsafe code inside the macro is always gonna be sound. So that's a manual check, but it's a check we only have to do once. And we review it on the list and we're, say, we're certain that it's all cool. The next uh, thing up is a timer handle. So a timer handle is uh, what we're gonna get back after we schedule a, a, a timer. So we call some kind of schedule method and we get something back. This handle was not in the V1, ver the, the first version of the patches. Um, the thing is we, we're using, uh, when, when we're scheduling this timer, that we have in, in, embedded in this struct, we need to make sure that the struct does not go away while the timer is armed. Because then when the timer fires, we're passing it a pointer uh, that we turn into a reference to the thing that was deallocated and we have a problem. In the, uh, in the first version of these patches, we transferred the ownership of this pointer into the arm timer so that the arm timer would uh, own uh, have the ownership of this uh, struct. Um, while that, that was fine in some regards, but the problem is that if the last reference to this uh, struct is owned by the timer, then we're gonna drop the timer, uh, the, the struct in the timer context. And uh, some allocator people told me that you cannot run the, the allocator in a um, timer context because it's not a sleepable context. So that was a problem, and we have, we have to make sure that we don't destroy any objects in this context. So instead of having the timer owning the, um, the reference, we're gonna have return this handle that's gonna own the data that the timer points to. And so as long as the handle is alive, we know, the, the, uh, uh, we know that the, the, the uh, struct that embeds the timer is also alive. And when we drop the hand, we, if we drop the handle, we cancel the timer, and then we're sure that when the, ti the timer can't fire and point to something invalid. Does that make sense? Okay. I put a safety comment up here uh, stating basically that if, if you drop this handle, you must cancel the timer, otherwise, and no, I didn't put the reason why, but just that you have to do it. So that when you implement this trade on a type, um, you wouldn't do that yourself, but the, the library would do that when implementing the timer handle. So we have a, a timer, um, timer pointer trait, which is a, a thing that you are allowed to call schedule on. This would, this would be like, a, um, in our case, a reference to a struct that contains a timer. It could be a box, which we heard about earlier today, which is a pointer. It's like a C++ unique pointer. So um, it's something that derefs to a, a struct that has a timer embedded. It can also be the, uh, the arc, which is, um, I don't know what the C++ one is, shot pointer. So a refer reference kind of counted smart pointer <laughs> that points to a struct that has a timer embedded. Um, and we just have like, uh, we have the, uh, the timer handle and that is the, the, the kind of handle you return. That would be different depending on what kind of pointer you point to your struct with. And you have the schedule method, which um, basically arms the timer. Now it says, uh, it says U64 here, but uh, uh, I forgot to update the slides. We actually now have a K time, uh, which wraps the, uh, uh, K, I, don't, I forget the kernel thing, struct for durations in the kernel, time t, k time t, something. It's basically nanoseconds with a 64-bit resolution. 
We also have a trade for um, the C site to hook into. This is also something that would be implemented in the kernel crate, not by the driver users, uh, but by the um, the the, uh, the like the uh, abstraction layer. And this exposes a C function uh, with the with the C linkage that the, we can actually install into the uh, struct HR timer uh, function field and have the C code call. The safety comment on this is just like, don't call it from anywhere else, only have it uh, being called from um, the HR timer subsystem. We, lastly, we have this uh, timer callback. This is what you would implement manually on your, uh, on your struct that embeds the timer. So this, um, for this you just fill out the thing that's going to point to my struct is going to be an arc or it's going to be a box or it's going to be a, a mutable reference or something. And um, when the timer fires, I'm going to implement this run method and that's what you're going to run when the timer fires. And so that's the only user, user provided code to use the timer subsystem. And just to see how all of this would tie together for um, uh, someone wanting to run a function on a timer, this is, this is the code you would have to type into your, uh, your driver. You put your struct or, or where you embed your, your timer and whatever other logic you want to put in. And then you, um, uh, I, here I put a constructor for my thing. This, uh, this type of constructor allows us to um, construct uh, this uh, struct in place. That's not uh, something that you can do uh, in the Rust language. Be you have move by default, so that's something we added uh, specifically um, for Linux. It, we call it, Benno did it, he calls it pin in it. So just allows you to construct this uh, type in place. We would also implement the uh, timer callback trait for our uh, for our struct, where we just put uh, some um, some stuff into our run method. In this case, we just we have uh, in the struct we had an atomic, so we're just going to atomic uh, boolean. We're just going to store true into this uh, atomic, and then in our um, just for the sake of example, we are going to spin while we're waiting for this. Uh, thing to become true, right? So we create our timer, we schedule it, and we wait for the flag to become true. When it becomes true, the timer has fired. So super simple. At least I think so. If, if you, it's not clear, please let me know. I will elaborate. This is all safe code. So this is, assuming we did the tricks we showed before correctly, this cannot have any memory on safety. That's the idea. So this, this is all great. Um, when in this case we're using an arc, which is like a, uh, there's a question down here. Miguel, can you, someone who has the, uh, the microphone? Over there. Um, I just want to, understand because the, the plan is also to make all the interfaces more stable or more self-explaining than, for example, they are in the kernel. Um, so um, my question here is this timer callback. You cannot have an HR timer without a um, timer callback. So is it somehow, I, I have no clue about Rust, no clue at all. I only know a little bit about timers. So <laughs> my question here is, is there, um, it's somehow ensured that there, the timer always has this callback? Yes, you cannot. Yes, by the, uh, in Rust we can put some bounds on the types that we implement traits for. So if you don't implement this uh, callback, the timer callback trait, you will get a compile error. Okay. It's gonna say trait bound not satisfied for this type. Okay. Uh, basically you can't. Okay, thanks. Yeah.
Yeah, for like if you're used to Rust, it will be uh, you will pretty you will know. Ex like first thing, I forgot to implement this trait. I'm just gonna go do that. If you like coming s straight into Rust, you're, it takes a while to figure out like what do these messages mean. Yeah. So the um, timer callback uh, function is that something that is like. Uh, like you generate a new version of the C bridge so that you you call it directly, or does it go through some kind of V table, like DIN in Rust? Is it a V table? So um, I'm not sure I exactly understand the question, but what's uh, the thing that's going to happen is we generate. We have this thing called monomorphization. OK, yes, you yeah. answered already the question. Yeah, so it's for the type. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, did, I didn't want to say the, the word. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There's a question down here. So Andreas, uh, what's the intrusive part of this timer? Yeah, so the intrusive part is, um, in, at least in, in, I guess, in C code in general, but also in particular, like, particularly in kernel code, we have uh, this pattern where you, for instance, if you have a linked list node and you want your struct to appear in a linked list, you put a uh, linked list struct, linked list node into your struct, and then you can sort of use that to thread into a list. That's the intrusive part. Like you put it into you, the handle into your struct, you don't put the struct into your handle. I see. Right? Um, and so the timer is essentially the same. There is a probably a list head in the HR timer that allow, or uh, maybe it's an RB tree or something that allows you to put it on the timer queue. Thanks. All right. So far, so good. Now we can have um, timer. Uh, we can have these structs on the heap, and uh, we can uh, have timers in them, and we can call them. We, we also have, I didn't put it here, but uh, I think at least, we, all, we can also, there's also some, um, uh, I also built another API where you can just put a closure and it will allocate uh, this uh, timer struct for you. So you, you basically just say schedule function, put your timeout and then a, a closure and then that will run at the specified time. Or, but it also, that one is also allocating uh, at the heap for the struct timer. Now, what about stack allocated timers? We have um, uh, the, the pin initialization that I talked about before can also allocate stuff on the stack. And in this case, uh, we allocate the uh, struct containing the timer on the stack, and then we schedule the timer, and we wait for the flag to be raised, and um, it's all good. But the thing is, if we did not wait for this um, timer to fire, then the stack could go away and we would have a timer pointing to something that's not there anymore, right? So we have to, basically we have to put a, a pin in the stack and make the stack not go away. Um, and uh, I, I thought about this for, for, for a bit and then in the Rust standard library, there is something called, there's threads, and then there's something called scope threads. Because when you spin up a thread, that, and that thread takes references to the calling stack, you basically have the same problem, that uh, it can go away, and then you would have another thread pointing to something that's gone. So we can do the same thing for our timers. Uh, oh yeah, okay, I got ahead of myself. First, the first thing we can do is we can make the timer pointer trade unsafe and just put a, re a safety requirement that if you use this um, uh, unsafe timer pointer, you have to make sure that your stack, the thing you point to doesn't go away, and then it's up to the caller. But obviously we don't want this in, um, in our drivers because that would mean unsafe code all over the place and like having to explain ourselves why is this safe, and that's, uh, that is of course prone to errors. Okay, so this is just demonstrating how to use uh, this unsafe uh, timer pointer. In this case, we just we put a safety comment here, and then we have the unsafe block here. And we say, okay, we promise the stack is not gonna go away uh, before the uh, timer fires. 
And then uh, this is actually a sound to do. But again, if we, uh, if we remove this while condition, we would uh, potentially uh, have a problem. One second, Alice. <laughs> so um, instead, we can have this uh, uh, schedule scoped, where we, t we, uh, we actually um, make sure that the stack does not go away by passing a closure to the schedule function. And then when the closure returns, we make sure that we block until the, uh, uh, we, sorry, we make sure that we drop the, the handle and thereby cancel the timer. So it cannot fire onto something that doesn't exist because it will be canceled. And then we can, the stack can go away. Now you can have your question, Alice. <laughs> Just to your point that this is difficult to do manually, I think you need an acquire load instead of a relaxed load for it to be okay. Potentially. No, I, I, I guess it's fine because it's like gonna, eventually it's going to be okay, right? Well, it depends on what is after the, the while. Like, this is correct. Yeah, yeah, in this case it's right. Yeah, in this case it's right. The, if you are doing something after the while, it may become acquire, of yeah, course, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, so if we do it like this, um, we, can, we, we can still do our uh, allocation on the stack, and uh, we can schedule, in this case we use the schedule scoped function, and we pass in a, the expiration, and then uh, this is a Rust syntax for a closure. And then we can do whatever we want inside the closure, and we know that once we get out of the scope, the timer will be uh, disarmed, no matter if it fired or not. And we're never going to have this issue of firing a timer that points to something that's gone. Yeah, so um, this, uh, my aim here is to get some ice on this uh, patch set that I, uh, I sent last night. <laughs> so uh, please go take a look, and uh, even if you're not rusty, uh, take a look and maybe you can spot something that's not right. I already found a problem myself, so <laughs> yeah. Um, there's still some stuff missing from this uh, patch set. Uh, there's a concept of sleepers where you just take the current uh, uh, task and basically make it sleep for the duration of the timer. We also do not, uh, we don't offer a selection of clock sources and we don't have a bunch of introspection uh, functions yet, but uh, I think these can be added uh, fairly easily after. Yeah, so this is all I have. There's a question down here. This might be a dumb question, but can you embed two timers in a struct? Not with this patch set, but uh, as Alice demonstrated in the work queue, uh, this can be achieved by adding a generic uh, ID to the, uh, all of the traits and like basically an integer, and that will uh, become part of the type and help you differentiate uh, which embedded timer you uh, fire on. I didn't put it because uh, it puts a lot of noise in an already uh, sort of convoluted system. So I wanted like this reviewed and understood first and then put that later. Uh, I just want to comment on the multiple timers. So, uh, other than what we do, what Alice does, we can also uh, put an array of timers header in the struct, and it could be simpler to uh, specify which timer you use to queue the timer, queue, queue the whole struct into a timer list. That can be simpler to put a ring. No, no, put an array, array of timer, timer head. An array? Yeah, array, Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, you could have an array, yeah, sure. That's uh, then, But then, you would, yeah, then it would be the index, I guess. I mean, yeah, yeah, you, you, can, you can use the index function to specify which timer you use, which, which timer or array structure you use, right? Yeah, and yeah. it's it maybe simpler than, you know, how multiple field and the using a type to describe that to where the field is. So. It might not be, it might be simpler to implement, but I'm not sure it would be simpler to use. But, but, but honestly, like, uh, if you have multiple timer header, you probably want to, like, uh, handling the timeout 
uh, yourself instead of relying on multiple timer, I think. If you have multiple timers, you would rather rely on handling? Because you, uh, say you have like two timers and one fair before the other one, and you actually, what well, I think the actual reasonable is just to, you know, you have one timer and you have the logic that what if this timer fair first and then what we'll do next? into the code. No, but you can just, you have the handle for the other one, you can just do whatever you want with it, cancel it, extend it forward now, forward later. I, I, I don't know, I don't know really, yeah. But uh, yeah, just, just saying that we have like other ways that other than introduce what, RQ, what, what we do for RQ to. Yeah, sure, let's, yeah. Uh, let's discuss. Uh, I I missed the the part uh, when where you made the uh, unsafe function the the schedule function unsafe. Does that also apply to heap allocated timers? No, no. So it's a different trait. Different trait. Yeah. Oh, different, different, different trait, trait that you implement for. So the safe one you would implement for box and arc and uh, a ref, which are yes. heap Good. pointing things, right? And then you would implement the unsafe one for um, pin ref and pin mute ref. Okay, yeah. so you, you, you can choose which one it is. Yeah, and so basically what I did is I, I implemented the unsafe one for the uh, two pinned references, and then I did a blanket implementation of the scoped one for all types that implement the unsafe one. All right, thank you. One, one thing that I, I wanted to, to talk about is we, we now have two <laughs> we, we now have two uh, two structs or rather essentially two types that, that need to use this intrusive pattern. And uh, my question would be if we if we were to, uh, to do we need more do, do we have more things on the C side that that require this intrusive stuff? And if so, we want pattern. to have a general pattern, pattern for that, for example, then we could have something like an intrusive uh, attribute macro on, on our structs that would actually implement that. Then you wouldn't need to call this impl uh, time, has timer for, for your struct. I think it's great if uh, someone can do some pattern matching here and uh, extract the common bits. Then uh, I chose to name my types differently from Alice's. Uh, so <laughs> we can fight about that. <laughs> uh, ben, I think the future plan is to use the field projection for those interesting uh, structs. That we, we certainly have a lot. We have RCU, and uh, we also have we also have G, like other uh, we also have software timers and uh, IRQ work. There's a lot of things. The list can go on now. We don't just have two examples. The linked list also uses the same pattern. Probably also the B tree, maybe? It should. It sh okay, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> the B tree is not intrusive right now okay. because it's a very old abstraction and it was written before we you know, were doing the intrusive stuff, but it should. Yeah. And um, I just have not. I just you know, would rather replace the red black trees with uh, X arrays and hash tables than spend the work on rewriting it for intrusive, but it certainly could support that. Cool. Yeah, so if anyone is interested in coming up with like an overarching thing that can encapsulate all of that, it's really cool. So if you come up with a generic thing, make it a crate like the pin in it that we can use from other projects that are more trying to integrate Rust into C code because the pin in it thing is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Andres. Thank you.